And I follow up on which one you narrow you ready to go? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know. for having me here and I also wanted to say a special thanks to my minders who are the most extraordinary people ever. <laughs> their kindness and their absolute curiosity. They are excellent conversationalists. They have taken such good care of me. Someone told me last night that in Singapore when people really care about you, they ask, have you eaten? Yeah. <laughs> my minders asked, not only have I eaten, but they took me to eat. And they made sure that I went with a number of them so that I could try as much food as possible, which I never would have been able to do on my own. So I'm incredibly grateful. Um, the other thing though, that happened over our lunch was that we began to have a conversation about um, very much in keeping with, with Natalie's um, talk tonight about how we find the words for things that feel inexpressible. The conversation went into trying to write about trauma, how to write about things like genocide, how to put into words things which we maybe believe never should be visited or spoken of again. And that conversation was just incredibly moving for me. Uh, my background is as a journalist. And I bring that very much to the work that I continue to do um, in both the memoir that I'm working on and in the continued longer project that I have been engaged with for quite a while now. Um, and I'm going to read excerpts from both those projects and bearing in mind what I'm trying to do in some ways, a kind of careful looking, a uh, very, very careful looking and observing, which allows for sometimes the very difficult things that, that people have been through to, to be expressed um, and to be expressed in a way that allows for empathy, that allows for transcendence, um, that allows us to enter into these very difficult experiences. Um, the first excerpt that I'm going to read for you is from a larger, um, more journalistic work that I've been um, engaged in now for um, going on four years, well, five years actually. Um, and this project I've been following with people who had been living um, were homeless with the exception of maybe having a car or maybe having a camper, um, the only thing left in their lives. And they had discovered that they could live uh, in their cars and campers at a rest stop along the interstate in Portland, Oregon. And in some cases, people had been living there going on over a decade. And I followed the community while they were living there and was also present, though, when the community was forced to leave. And in the following years, I've still been following the different people um, who were residents of the rest stop and seeing what has happened to them since they've been cast adrift from what was maybe the most solid experience in their life. So the first excerpt is, is sort of post-rest stop, what is happening to some of the people who live there. The big dog sinks that someone's approaching on the mud path and inside the tent, planted between cottonwoods, Joey stirs. She pushes aside the Nora Roberts novel she fell asleep the green. The pages warped from the moisture of the rain and the exhalations of sleep. She blinks a few times to clear her eyes, pats the pocket of her shirt for her lighter, listens to the dog strain against its rope. The other night it was the police, a female officer who had come down to check on Joey after they'd taken Charlie away again on his parole officer's orders. Are you really down here all by yourself? The officer had asked, shining her flashlight through the tent's open flaps. What did you expect to find? Joey had replied over her dog's high notes. That I'd be down here having a big old party? She waggled her lip, wrapped to me in a cast for emphasis. Before she left, the woman gave Joey her card, just in case you run into any trouble. And Joey had slipped it, slipped it between the swollen pages of her book thinking about the cell phone wrapped in a sock and stowed in a corner of the tent that still turned on, but didn't have any credit left to make a call. Jolie had been unable to fall back asleep after that. She tried to focus on the sound of the river just 500 yards away, tried to let the white noise wash over her, but all she could think about was Charlie, what she could possibly do this time to get him out, what would happen if she didn't. She practiced the speeches she would make to the judge. Do you realize who you're really punishing here? 
In jail, he has three cots and a cot, while I'm stuck here on my own, living rough with a broken ankle. But for every argument she raised, she could think of an equally compelling reason why no one would listen. And she worked herself up in this way until she was crying, whispering to herself in the dark, down there, you're losing it, Joan. Finally, she tried humming, and the first tune that came to mind was the lullaby she used to sing to her daughter at night before Jolie had given the girl up to her mother to raise. The notes went to ash in her mouth, and so she turned to her romance until the words on the page blurred, and then nothing until the dogs came. The river's running high, its waters riled and roomy, but Jolie tells me it's nothing to worry about though she eyes it warily from the tent flap as she wraps her cast in a Safeway plastic bag to try and shield it from the incessant wet. Back in January, the river swamped the banks, then surged. Charlie was still with her then, and they'd had just enough time to untie the dog and grab their backpacks and race up the rise behind them through the blackberries to the back of the Ford dealership property where they clung to the cyclone fence watching the waters of the Malala River swallow their possessions. When it receded, they walked the banks, retrieving what had been snagged on the cane and scrub, sleeping bags and single socks, cooking pots. Jolie spotted their tent, wedged in the crotch of a tree on the opposite bank. Together, they salvaged what they could, but she doesn't know what she'll do if it happens again, now that she's here alone. It's not that she hasn't learned over the years how to start over from nothing, again and again, to test the limits of her resourcefulness. When she was growing up, Jolie's dad took her with him to elk camp every year, taught her from when she was just a little girl how to survive on her own in the woods. And then he's all pissed off now that I take that knowledge and use it to live like I do, she says. But sometimes, a part of the wonders of her dad might be right. If the last 20 years with Charlie where she's lived almost exclusively outdoors or in vehicles, with the exception of brief stints and apartments and hotels that by her reckoning totaled no more than a year, might be wearing on her emotionally and physically. People have been telling her to make a fresh break now while Charlie's back in jail. Even Charlie's dad has told her, he might be my son and I think you're the best thing that's ever happened to him, but he only drags you down, Jim. And there are days when she agrees with them all, when she thinks about how they ended up down here by the river in the first place, how Charlie took off in the van where they'd been living, hot pissed, as Charlie puts it, after they argued over something. His license had been suspended long ago between his epilepsy and the old driving under the influence, DUIs. Uh, but there he was, leaving down I-5, tossing cans of hurricane out the window and the cops pulling over. Never one for subtlety, says Joey. After the police arrested Charlie, they impounded the van. There was no way Jolie could come up with the impound fees, let alone Charlie's bail. And like that, they lost their home and all the possessions inside. After Charlie was released on probation, they moved to this site along the Malala at the invitation of Charlie's cousin, Robbie Baker. Robbie had been camping on this section of the Malala for years. He was free with his extra gear, shared firework, firewood tarps and blankets. But when the flood came, it swept away everything they'd managed to build back up. Then just a few weeks later, Robbie was walking the train tracks up to Safeway to fly a sign, which is to beg for money. A friend had lent him an iPod. He never heard the train approach, an Amtrak making its daily run from Seattle to Eugene. Charlie refused to touch Robbie's tent after that, just let it stand. One day, Jolie saw two feral cats burrowed in the bedding inside. She stood quietly for half a breath, debating what to do, and had just made up her mind to leave when, she saw, when they saw her and pitched themselves into the underbrush. The incident with the van was why Charlie was still on paper, why he was supposed to check in with his parole officer every week. But when Jolie broke her ankle, he missed an appointment, and the parole officer revoked him, revoked him immediately. Now he faces 18 months in prison. Jolie has no love for Charlie's PO. Jolie suspects that the woman simply wants to ease her workload by sending clients to jail at the first opportunity. But she can also feel her anger and frustration toward Charlie building with each passing day. 
as she hobbles outside by herself on $4.99 crutches from Goodwill to tighten the tarps and shake away the water cooling on the tent's roof, as she rations the dog's food and rolls her last shreds of tobacco, she thinks that all this can be traced back to Charlie in some way. And then this morning, getting up to pee in the rain, she slipped and fell and ruined her last good pair of pants, the pair she planned to wear to Charlie's upcoming court date. Why do you have to be so damn stupid all the time, she says, lying on her back, imagining Charlie, warm and dry in his black and whites, over at the Clackamas County Jail, as the dog dances around her in the mud. Her first husband beat her, and she said after that she'd never take it again, not without hitting back. Once, she smashed Charlie's nose with a Coleman lantern when he was being drunk and belligerent, thinking he could come at her. She refuses to be put in a position of helplessness ever again, but this ankle has hobbled her in ways she can't overcome. She's been warned not to put weight on it. She's read the, quote, aftercare instruction sheet, end quote, from the doctor until the print has faded from her touch. Maintaining alignment of the broken ankle, ankle is of the utmost importance for future mobility, but her current situation has made that impossible. Safeway is less than a mile of the road, and she's dragged herself up there a couple times when food and tobacco have run out, first swallowing ibuprofen from her cupped palm, no water, then down the mud path over the rocks and into the blackberries to avoid the pebbles lapping across the path, the water thick with mosquito larva. And wheezing now up onto the highway, where it will take her an hour each way to get along the shoulder of 99 East, the plastic bag of groceries biting into her fingers, and banging against her bad leg. Before Charlie went to jail again, they were managing to get by on his $300 disability check and what they could make from collecting cans. Typically, a solid four hours of collecting could bring in as much as $10. Charlie had even developed a route for them, up and down the cul-de-sac streets of Canby. But she can't walk it now on her own, not with her ankle. By locking Charlie up, she wants to tell the judge, the court has seriously threatened my means of survival. She wonders if imperiled is not a better word, or maybe the word she wants is destroyed. This is what she thinks about when she cannot sleep, the best words to express her case, the right word for all she needs to say. She calls it flipping through the big book of synonyms in my head. But when she and Charlie lived for a stretch at a rest stop along I-5, and there had been dozens of others in the same situation, all of them living out of their cars in the back lot. And the fights had started over who could panhandle the drivers emerging from their trucks and sedans for money. And some people were accused of being too aggressive. Jolie had been the one to pull everyone together to say that it would be in their best interest to get a check on themselves before the police got involved. This place was made for people to crash out and rest. That's the expectation they have coming here, she said. So you shouldn't be disturbing these people passing through. You need to stop thinking them as customers, people you can hit up for a buck. These aren't customers. These are patrons. Charlie is not her husband. Sometimes he is her fiance, but only because Jolie cannot think of a better word. Lately, as she reads her book alone in a tent, and there is only rivered silence, and the dogs snoring gently, from the pile of sleeping bags beside her, she has felt her mind tracing the outlines of the word X. For the first time in years, she can drink half a beer and leave the rest for later without hiding it from Charlie. There is no yelling, no nagging Charlie about what will happen if he doesn't take his dilantin all of those hours nursing him through his seizures. Once, when she was living with Charlie at the rest stop, one of their neighbors, a gray-faced man named Ray, had taken Jolie aside and pressed a hundred dollars in her palm. His breath still smelled of yesterday's beer. Use it to leave him, was all he said. And that had been the last of it. He never brought it up again, and she never told Charlie, who wandered over to Ray's most mornings to knock on the door for a ride to the convenience store, and then drank with him for the rest of the day. Um, my second excerpt is also, in some respects, a, a portrait. Uh, in this case, this is from my memoir, In Progress, where I am writing about um, my family's history. My family were uh, refugees from Latvia at the end of the Second World 
before. And um, as much as they sort of had uh, violence and difficulty of war visited upon them, we were also a part of the sort of violence and conflict that was inflicted in that corner of the world as well. And um, part of what I'm trying to do is retrace the stories of um, my, my grandmother who fled um, and her sister who decided to remain behind in Latvia. What happened to both of them? And in this particular excerpt, I'm just going to read a little bit about my grandmother, who I lived with from when I was two until I was eight years old. Once, my grandmother's mother had apparently shown up at our home moments after her death, more than 5,000 miles away, but only my grandmother saw her. She emerged from the seam that runs between darkness and daylight to stand at the edge of my grandmother's bed as my grandfather snoring and twitched beside her. It was the first time my grandmother had seen her mother in more than 20 years, and her face looked withered, like flowers left in a vase without water. My grandmother opened her mouth to say something, but before she could speak, before she could form the words, forgive me, her mother leaned over and placed a calloused palm on my grandmother's curled head. She let it rest there for a moment, then she disappeared. My grandmother seemed to accept the brief terms of this visitation. She too had disappeared just as quickly from her family's life, though her vanishing had been the living kind, born of war and panic, the heavy trundle of red star tanks over cobblestone, airships swimming overhead, flames where roofs should have been, and from somewhere nearby, the sound a building makes just before it crumbles, a whoosh of air like breath released from a cracked sternum. Alone with two small children, her husband away at the Russian front. My grandmother had monitored the climax of the Second World War from a rented apartment in the Latvian capital with an address of 71 Peace Street. Between the choiring of the bombs, she breastfed her newborn son and hoped she could remain in one place long enough for her body to heal, for the bleeding to finish. But as the glass in the windows rippled and it became clear she couldn't wait where she was any longer, she dropped diapers into a sack and tied a green and yellow scarf she needled with her mother's help around her shoulders. She picked up her three-week-old son, made her two-year-old daughter clasp her hand, and ran. There was no time to write a letter, to address it to the family who waited three hours to the east in the town of Volvena, in a brown shingled farmhouse where my grandmother had been born, and which she had left only a few years before, the first in her family to venture beyond its boundaries for a new life in the city. The day she left the farm, her whole family had accompanied her to the train station, still in their milking boots, and they had cried and waved at my grandmother until the train finally pulled me on view. Now, there was no time for my grandmother to say goodbye to her mother and father and her brother and her sister. No way to tell them where she was heading, because even she had no idea. It was too late for her to do anything anymore, except to try and stay on her feet ahead of the Russian troops, thousands of them, marching behind the battle standard of the USSR, silk screened with hammer and sickle, Latvia's flag. She left Latvia at the end of September. It was June when she finally crossed into British-occupied British territory in the north of Germany, and she and the children were officially registered as displaced persons, assigned to a refugee camp erected on the outskirts of the port city of Hamburg, where she sometimes went on day passes to pick through the rubble for things to burn and cook fire. Over the years, she lay on her pallet in the refugee camp. She clutched the family's passports and entrance papers to the U.S. and felt the transport planes rising, its wings tipped to the sea. My grandmother never stopped saying the name of the home she had lost. Tacoma, she practiced the smell of the mills as the smell of the mills punched through the cracks in the windows of her new home, an apartment in a downtown tenement where the volunteers from the local Lutheran family services had indicated through gentle pantomime that the family now lived. But that word had always remained unsure on her tongue. It would never sound as natural as the way she said, Lemony, which she had first learned from her grandfather, a shoemaker from Volvina, who was shoe whiskers but let his eyebrows grow like cumulus clouds. This was the name her grandfather had bestowed on the two-bedroom farmhouse built under the shelter of two maple trees. There, he raised his only child, a boy, who would grow up to become my grandmother's father, 
a man of wax mustaches and a fine way with hops, known for the batches of ale he kept in the granary, always enough to lend to a wedding or a wake. My grandmother's mother was ten years younger than her husband, and everyone agreed that she possessed the patience required to ret the farm's flags and spin its fibers into linen so fine and soft that it felt weightless. Yet she was also quick to snap a switch from the nearest tree if she sensed the slightest misbehavior. This was the world my grandmother was born into, where landscape was lineage and the span of a life could be measured by all that was held within the farm's boundaries. There she knew it was summer by the smell of freshman hay, fall when the saffron milk caps rose from the decay of the forest floor, spring by the stork swinging overhead. Each day was organized around the rhythms and habits of the cows, and almost as soon as my grandmother and her siblings could walk, they were toddling behind the slope of the cortege as it mouthed its way across the pastures, and they remained with the herd until evening, and when it was time to drive them back to their places in the barn. My grandmother spent more than a decade not knowing what had happened to her family and to the farm after she left Latvia. Even when she was finally able to reestablish contact with her relatives in Golden, communication was spread, halting. How far away she felt from the days when she could sit with her family in the kitchen of the farmhouse, every so hot tea, replaying the events of the day. Often, it was a catalog of nothing. Maybe a heifer had been born in a broken mouth. A cloud had passed overhead in the shape of a girl. The bees seemed agitated. Now, as she sat alone at her table in Tacoma, crying over the pages of the latest stilted letter, quote, we went far away to work for a time. There was a part of my grandmother that understood she could never return to that place again. But there was also a part of my grandmother that refused to accept the idea that she could never return to that place again. In the end, my grandmother decided to try and find a way to occupy the space that bordered both realities. Until the day she could return to the farm, she would rebuild it here, board by board, through memory. At first, she did it by herself, silently setting the survey lines. She raised the sky just far enough overhead so that it felt as if you could reach up and brush your fingers against it when you lay on your back in the grass. She smoothed the fields out to the edges of the horizon and then summoned the forest, dense and dark. Behind the screening branches, she placed the anthills and the badger burrows. Reluctantly, she conjured the mosquitoes and horse flies, if only for the sake of accuracy, the way they blacken the summer air. Orchards sown, she put replanted the gooseberries and currants and let their rows grow in booby vines curling back on themselves like the ends of her father's mustache. She staked the stems of the lonely dahlias and drove posts of the picket fence deep into the soil, but still it would list. She bucked hay into the loft and stacked logs for winter's approach. And since this was a world summoned entirely from memory, there were places where the landscape dropped away without any explanation. Sudden chasms of white space, unresolved constructions, the milking barn contained stools, but not a single churn. The horse grazed endlessly, rain striking through clover. Inside the house, some of the rooms appeared never to have been framed or plastered. The same hallway led to different bedrooms each time it was accessed. Outside the kitchen window, lilacs bloomed, regardless of seasons. This is how I knew someone had died. My grandmother would pull out her paring knife from the kitchen drawer and head to her garden to cut calla lilies, carrying them to the funeral cupped in the hollow of her palm. This is how she soothed me back to sleep when I woke crying, the same hollow of her hand cupped against my cheek. I began living with my grandparents following the collapse of my parents' marriage, a bitter coming undone that had left them both emotionally incapable of caring for me. In my mother's case, it was also a legal ruling, her parental rights clipped, like the front end of a stranger's car she met with her own in a haze of drink. Custody was awarded exclusively to my father, the infant my grandmother had delivered as the bombs ran down on Liga. But my father, for his part, was lost deep in his own anger and sorrow and silence. Five years home from Vietnam, and he remained as tightly locked inside himself as the day he returned. 
just as he had seen his own father do a quarter of a century earlier. My father's not speaking was much quieter than my grandfather's, not so much a refusal as a seeding to paralysis. He simply stopped being. And so my grandparents made a place for me in their home while he tried to return to himself. Where once I had known only one word for mother, now there were two. My grandmother was the one who took me to the backyard and showed me how to find the sweetest raspberries hidden in the shade of the leaves. She was the one who set me on a kitchen chair, draped an apron around my neck, and let me sink my fists into the warm rising dough. She was the one who said my name over and over again until it sounded like a song. The one who took me in her lap and comforted me after I spent hours on the porch with my suitcase waiting for the mother who promised but never came. I am now raising little Inada, my grandmother wrote to the relatives back in Latvia, who by this time she had not seen in 30 years. I've fallen deeply in love with her as she has with me. She calls this her home. But at night sometimes she jumps up screaming, I want my daddy, where is my daddy? Not once has she called out for her mother. We speak Latvian at home, and she understands everything. She's enthralled with books, and I read aloud to her from titles meant for older children, Hansel and Gretel, Snow White. Sometimes she sits alone with piles of books and reads by herself. We have no neighbors with children she can play with, but maybe it's not so important yet. She turns just three in December. When she first came into my care, Inada was so terribly anxious and disturbed. It's required real effort to bring this little child to this place of calm. Two years later, she wrote, Inada's mother comes to get her for visits only now and again, mostly because she does not seem to have time for the girl. What she did not share in her letters, but instead documented in a small spiral notebook that I would not find until years after the death. Once, I came home from one of those rare visits with a burn on my face in the shape of a lit cigarette. For as long as she lived, my grandmother never spoke to me about my mother, about what she did or did not do, what had happened or not happened in my earliest years, that I, need, that I would need to be taken from her. And I never asked, as if I agreed that this was something that should not be given voice. In the region of Latvia where my grandmother was raised, there are people who believe even to this day that the right words, spoken in the right combination, are a way of resurrecting what has been lost. Or, as an old man once asked me, did I know that there were times when words could be more than words? It's true, he insisted. Words can become as real as anything we see with our eyes or feel with our hands. I saw a man put out a fire using only words. The house was engulfed and they'd run out of water, but then he arrived and he walked in circles around the house very calm, one way and another, repeating something into the flames. This was how my grandmother sounded when she spoke to me of her former home, the farm she had rebuilt from memory, like someone who believed structure of it protected, even saved through her telling. We might be standing at the edge of my grandparents' property, which abutted a city salvage yard, feeding scraps of paper to the burn barrel. Then the wind would start, rattling the leaves of the nearby birch, and in its chatter, my grandmother would hear the voices of the trees she had once moved through every day. Do you hear it? she asked, urging me to follow her deep into the black and white thickets of her memories. This is what it sounds like when you speak. Or maybe one morning we would wake to snow, and as we looked out the window together, she would remake its falling with her words until it became the hip-high drifts that sucked at the hooves of the draft horse, now harnessed to a sleigh upon which my grandmother's gown rode, their laps weighted with blankets and furs. She led me to the nest in the grass where she hid with her little brother from her mother's paws, let me peer into the cradle of her baby sister, born when my grandmother was 15. She revealed to me the location of the chest in which she had concealed love letters from a boy she thought she had married before my grandfather. And sometimes, I suspected, I could hear the drawer scraping open inside her, as if she were pulling out the letters to reread them. Each time she showed me something, it filled in a new location on the map of the property I now carried within me, until I began to think I knew my way back on my own. Thank you.